I want to just talk a little bit about citizenship because as I said, the difference between Palestinians here and Palestinians in the occupied territories is citizenship. So we really have to understand this issue of citizenship. This is what's distinguishing them. So let's just quickly think about what's a, how citizenship works in Israel. The first thing we need to notice is that we have two citizenship laws. We have the law of return that applies to the Jewish population from 1950 and then we have the 1952 citizenship law that applies to the non-Jewish population. Now that should already start setting off alarm bells for most of us because in a democracy you would expect citizenship to be some kind of level playing field for everybody. Everybody gets the same rights. There's equality. That's the whole point of citizenship in a democracy. And yet we've got two citizenship laws. Now I suggest you see the two citizenship laws as doors into Israel. So the law of return is a door that's wide open, welcoming every Jew in the world to come here and instantly get citizenship. But 20% of the population here are not Jews and they're getting their, their rights, their citizenship from another piece of legislation, the citizenship law. Now this I would suggest you see is a, a door that's almost entirely shut. Only a very small number of people can get through this door after the original Palestinians who remain after 1948 get citizenship this way. Today, if you want to get citizenship and you're not Jewish, there's only one way to do it, and that's by marrying an Israeli citizen. Doesn't matter whether they're a Jewish citizen or a Palestinian citizen, but they have to be a citizen. And then according to the law, it takes five years. Five year naturalization process and theoretically you can get citizenship. Now I went through that door. I have Israeli citizenship. It took me eight years and threatening lawyers' letters to get it. I have friends who've been doing it a lot longer than that, still don't have it. So Israel tries to make it difficult. According to the Israeli media, only about 50 to 60 people, non-Jews, get citizenship through this law a year. And the point of this is, of course, to make sure, we're talking about a Jewish state, that the state remains Jewish. And the easiest way to do that is through the citizenship laws to exclude non-Jews from citizenship. So they make it extremely difficult. It's just this one way to do it. I say that the door is very narrow, tightly shut, a very small number of people can get through it. There is one group that could come through that door in large numbers, theoretically which are Palestinians in the occupied territories. Because if enough of them marry Palestinians inside Israel and naturalize that way, you could get serious numbers of Palestinians gaining Israeli citizenship. So how has Israel, how has Israel dealt with that? Well, historically what it did, it just ignored the law when it came to Palestinians. If you applied as a Palestinian, you almost certainly wouldn't get citizenship. So what happens uh, after 67 is Israel ignores the law. Most Palestinians, went, I mean, it's not, there are many Palestinians here in Nazareth. We're only a half hour from Janine. It's quite normal for Palestinians in Nazareth to be working or studying in Janine or vice versa, people from Janine studying and working here. And for relationships to develop, there are also families that cross the Green Line, fa families in Nazareth that have refugee families in the West Bank. So it was quite normal for, for relationships to develop across the Green Line, the separation between the two territories and for marriages to, to develop out of that. So these, these couples had tended to think, well, Israel isn't going to give us citizenship anyway. There's freedom of movement. We, after 67, it's easy for, to cross over these two, the green line between these two territories. We'll just carry on without the citizenship. <coughs> we'll carry on living this way. Oslo changes all that. The whole point of the Oslo Accords is to create separation for Palestinians, not for Israeli Jews. Israeli Jews are still going into the occupied territories, into the settlements. In fact, the boom time for the settlements is during Oslo in the 1990s. But for Palestinians, we start to see that a separation is applying. And it starts with checkpoints and permit systems. And then later, of course, it develops into the separation barrier, the wall, fence, whatever you want to call it. And this becomes a real physical obstacle that Palestinians can't easily cross. And so at this point, uh, couples that are marrying across the Green Line, they start to apply for citizenship for their spouse. Now what happens in practice is Israel continues to ignore the law, but it becomes a vital interest to these Palestinian couples that something is done about it, that they get citizenship for their spouse. And so they take an action, a class action suit to the uh, Supreme Court in 1999, demanding their rights, and the Supreme Court backs them, says yes, the law says five years, you've got to, you've got to honor the law. Now it says the law has to start applying from this date, 1999, when the Supreme Court hearing is held. You can do the maths. Five years from 1999 means that in 2004 we'll see the first Palestinians from the occupied territories getting citizenship. 
It doesn't happen because in 2003 Israel changes the law. It amends the citizenship law, it's the citizenship and entry into Israel law, and this effectively uh, makes it impossible for Palestinians to live together across the Green Line. If they marry, the Palestinians from here can't go into the occupied territories, and those from the occupied territories can't come into Israel. So they can marry, but they can't live together. So effectively, marriage is bar barred, banned for them. And this is the that's the situation that applies to this day. So it, when it went to the Supreme Court, there was a challenge to this. Supreme Court judges backed this law, and the argument was that uh, it, it wasn't, interestingly, it wasn't the argument that Israel originally made for this law, that it was a security law to stop Palestinians from the occupied territories coming in and becoming suicide bombers or launching terrorist attacks. There was no evidence that this is what was going on, but Israel used this as the excuse for the law. When it was tested in the Supreme Court, interestingly, both the uh, government and the judges accepted a rather different argument. They argued that the Palestinians in the occupied territories were a demographic demon, as they were called. That, there, that this might be, as other, uh, another argument that was made, is that Palestinians were using this law as a, 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 a right of return through the back door, to get Palestinian citizenship through the back door. So it was a demographic argument that was made. and gives us a, a, an idea about why, how Israel has shaped these citizenship laws. They're shaped and they're engineered, crafted, precisely to protect Israel's Jewishness. That's the purpose of the citizenship laws. That's why they've been drafted the way they have, why they're separate. Because you can change one law without changing the other. You can change the rights of Palestinians under the citizenship law without affecting the rights of, Israel, uh, of Jews from around the world to come here using the law of return. So we can see there's some problem here with the citizenship laws. But to understand how citizenship works here, we also need to think about another distinction Israel makes, which is between citizenship and nationality. There are more than 130 nationalities recognized in Israel, <clears throat> but there is one nationality Israel refuses to recognize. It's gone to the Supreme Court twice, and the court has backed the government on this, refusing to recognize that nationality. Let me ask you, do you know what that nationality is? Palestinian. Palestinian. Makes sense, it's logical, isn't it? Palestinian. Everybody agreed? I'm sure Peter knows the answer to this. It's not Palestinian. He should know the answer to this. It's not Palestinian. Very good. It's Israeli. Israel refuses to recognize the nationality of Israeli. Why would it do that? Because it includes everyone. Exactly, yeah. Because then it would be a state of the Israelis, and that's not what it is. It doesn't even claim to be that. It claims to be a Jewish state, a state for the Jews. And so what Israel has done is created two main categories of nationality, Jewish and Arab. Most people fall into those categories. You need 137 plus nationalities to deal with all, all the anomalies because I'm now an Israeli citizen, but what's my nationality? British. Exactly, I'm an Israeli citizen with British nationality. That's why you need all those 137 or so classifications. But most people fall into the Jewish or Arab category. And this is how Israel structures the discrimination and also at the same time conceals it. So the way it works is this way. Israel creates citizenship rights for everybody who's a citizen. There's one layer of rights that everybody gets. They're the citizenship rights. And what Israel would like is for you to just concentrate on those citizenship rights. Because as long as you're just looking at that, Israel looks very democratic and equal. But then what Israel also does is create another layer of national rights. And only one group gets the national rights. And I don't need to ask you which group that is for you to work it out. So the Jews get national rights and citizenship rights, where Palestinians only get citizenship rights inside Israel. And if there's a conflict between the citizenship rights and the national rights, the Jewish national rights trump the individual citizenship rights. Now that all sounds a bit abstract, but we've already dealt with one of these matters in the talk so far. If we think about it, think about that citizenship law and that law of return, because this illustrates it very well. The law of return gives a national right to Jews everywhere to immigrate to Israel. Whereas the citizenship law only gives a specific individual right to each Palestinian who is here to live here. It doesn't give them any other rights to bring relatives here. In fact, it does the exact opposite. It strips Palestinians of those national rights so precisely so they can't bring their relatives who were made refugees in 1948 into the country. Just to, to, to try and clarify this a bit more, let's just look at two key resources. I talked earlier about this idea of the difference between trivial, petty, visible apartheid and grand or resource apartheid. 
Now let's get to these key resources that we were talking about earlier in the case of South Africa. What about the, the resources inside Israel? Who gets them? Well, we can look at it. Let's look at the two key material resources a state offers its citizens. Those are land and water. You won't survive long without those. So how does Israel deal with them? Well, they illustrate the point slightly differently. Water, well, it's a citizenship right, which means every citizen gets water. When you turn on your tap, you're getting the same quality of water at the same price whether you're a Jew or a Palestinian, wherever you're living, if you're living in a Palestinian community or a Jewish community. Get equality there, individual equality between the populations. As you point out though, there are Palestinians that are citizens, but they're living somewhere where they shouldn't be living. They're living on land that the government claims is national land, state land. And these are the Bedouin living in their unrecognized communities. So they're citizens, they have a right to water, but they're living illegally on land, or the state says they're illegally on land that belongs to the state, which is there for a national purpose. So we have a conflict here. So Israel has tried to get these Palestinians, the Bedouin, as you've seen, off their land, tries to drive them off the land. And one of the tools it tried to use was by depriving them of water. But this was taken to the courts. And the courts ruled, well, they are citizens, so they do have a right to water, an individual right to water. And it solved the problem a bit like the Sol wi Solomon, uh, wisdom of Solomon. This is how it was applied. They said, yes, the courts ruled, yes, they have a right to water as citizens, but they don't have a right to water where they live because they're living somewhere illegally. So what they, the, the compromise was they could have the water as long as it was somewhere distant. So they, create a, they, they put a standpipe two or three kilometers away from the village and the villagers have to go and collect their water from there. Just contrast that with the situation of Palestinians in the West Bank, in Area C. Have you, you've been to Area C, yeah. So there, that's two thirds, nearly two thirds of the West Bank. Now the people there are living under full Israeli military and civil control. In other words, in terms of international law, they are as much Israel's obligation as are their own citizens. They're as obligated to provide them with services as they are their own citizens here. So how does Israel deal with them in terms of water? Well, it, as you've probably seen, it doesn't. What it does is it, to excuse the pun, washes its hands of them. It says they have to sort out their own water problems. And so they collect, you'll see that they collect rainwater in the winter or they truck it in at great expense themselves. And these are agricultural communities, so they need the water very desperately. So here's a quite a good illustration of the privileges you get with Palestinian citizenship. The government is forced to provide you with water as an individual citizenship right when it doesn't do the same for Palestinians in the occupied territories, even though they're falling fully under Israeli control. So that's the citizenship right. Does that mean that therefore there is equality in water provision? Not really, because there's also a national right to water. If, if you want to farm commercially here, you need uh, access to cheap water, recycled water, subsidized water, grey water. You need some kind of extra, you can't just turn on your tap and, 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 and spray your crops with water in the same way you fill the bath. It's just not commercially viable. So Israel does it this way. What it says is you can be a farmer, you can practice agriculture, but you can only do it in farming communities. And we went to one, the Moshav or the Kibbutz, they're famous, these agricultural communities. Hundreds of them all over Israel. And these are the only places where you can really do commercial agriculture. Now here's the catch, as I mentioned earlier. To live in one of these communities, you need to go through an admissions committee. And the function of the admissions committee is to keep Palestinian citizens out. They will always reject you if you're a Palestinian cit citizen. So if you want to practice agriculture, you have to be a Jew in practice, because you have to live in one of these communities. That's how Israel reserves the national right to water for the Jewish population and deprives Palestinian citizens. Where you see Palestinian citizens with some land still, places like Sakhnin and Arabe, where they fought land day and they managed to hold on to some of their land, in those places you'll see that they're farming their lands, but they're, what they're doing almost always is they're planting olive trees. They have to plant olive trees, by the way, just like they do in Area C, because if they don't farm the land, Israel will use the old Ottoman law of the fallow lands law and take it away from them. If you don't farm it for three years, it reverts to the state, in this case a Jewish state, and you'll lose it. So they have to farm it, but they can't afford to farm it commercially because they don't have access to water. So what do they do? They plant olive trees because they're almost drought resistant. The problem with that, of course, is then that drives down the price, supply and demand, it drives down the price of olives, which is why Palestinians in Area C in such hard times, because they rely on farming, but they can't find an easy way to grow crops that they can sell commercially to make money. So they, it's catch-22 there. Okay, that's water. Now let's just quickly deal with land. Land is very stark. Land, 93% of the land of Israel has been nationalized for the Jewish people. 
It's not nationalized for Israelis because, as I mentioned, there's no Israeli nationality. You can't nationalize it for a group that doesn't exist. So it's nationalized not even for Israeli Jews. There were some Israeli left-wing Israeli Jews who, who went to the Supreme Court arguing there should be recognized an Israeli Jewish nationality or what's called a Hebrew nationality. They said we've been a separate people with Hebrew as our primary language. We've developed a culture, a language uh, based around our Hebrew identity and therefore that should qu qualify as a nationality. The Supreme Court ruled no, there's no Jewish nationality apart from the global Jewish nationality. Now, when it's nationalized for, 93% of the land is nationalized for the Jewish people. So what happens if you're a Jew in Israel and you buy land, like we saw in the Moshav? What happens is you buy land from the government and you buy a lease, 49, 99 years. You don't own the land. You're, you're, you you uh, sit on the land, guarding it or protecting it on behalf of the Jewish people everywhere. Why are you guarding it and protecting it? Well, you're guarding it and protecting it from the original owners. Who are the original owners? The Palestinian refugees, all those refugees, 750,000 refugees expelled in 1948. So you're guarding it, protecting it from uh, the refugees, and you're, you're guarding it and protecting it on behalf of uh, the Jewish people everywhere, not just Israeli Jews. So this brings us kind of back full circle, because we have a law of return that says every Jew in the world belongs to Israel. They should be here even. That's what we hear Netanyahu saying, don't we? Every time there's a, an attack on a Jewish community around the world, he says the real home, the true home of Jews is here in Israel. He's even trying to pass a law, a basic law, that's a sort of constitutional type law in Israel, that would define Israel as the nation state of the Jewish people. Not the Israeli people, not the Israeli Jewish people, but the Jewish people everywhere. So from Israel's point of view, Every Jew in the world belongs here. They are really a citizen here. It's just some of them have not actualized it by actually coming here yet. But from Israel's point of view, they belong here. Which starts to give us a sense that actually citizenship in Israel only refers to the Jewish population. That we're playing around with terms again here. When we talk about citizenship, Israeli citizenship, we're really kind of playing around. It's a kind of magician's trick. It's a slate of hand going on here. That actually it's Jewish nationality which is the real citizenship here. But if that's the case, then what are the Israeli citizens who aren't Jews? What are they? Well, I would argue that they're temporary guest workers here. That's their real status. They're here on license only as long as they don't cause too much problem for a Jewish state. And they can do that two ways. The first way they can do it is by trying to bring more Palestinians here. Demographic threat. And we've already seen how Israel is dealing with that by changing the citizenship law to stop that right of return through the back door, to stop Palestinians trying to bring uh, other Palestinians in through marriage. So Israel has already shut down that threat. The other threat, the other threat is an ideological one, and that's also been posed by Palestinians. We have uh, this uh, issue of, uh, in the 1990s, a new Palestinian party emerges that uh, promotes this idea of Israel as a state of all its citizens. It says Israel should stop being a Jewish state and it should reform itself and become a state of all its citizens, a liberal democracy where everybody has equal rights. How has Israel responded to that campaign? Well, we know because in 2006, Ehud Olmer, who's the prime minister at the time, he meets the Shin Bet. Shin Bet, as I mentioned before, domestic intelligence service, Shin, it's secret police really. And they meet Olmert and they have this uh, uh, d discussion about the status of the state of all its citizens campaign. And the decision they come to is that this is the equivalent of subversion. And they announce this in a press release to us all. They tell us it's, they consider it to be subversion. They will use any means, including non-democratic ones, to defeat this campaign. And that's the status we're at today. So if you're a Palestinian inside Israel, you know you need to gain your rights, true equality here. You need to reform Israel from a Jewish state to a state of all its citizens. But you also know that if you do so, that the Israeli authorities would define you as a subversive. It's a tough one. Okay.